uh, we all are good in uh, performing a, a micro lumbar discectomy. Uh, though we always, uh, we have been trained to do it through the interlaminar approach. And let us go through the history of interlaminar discectomy. Um, the first operation uh, through this route, through the midline approach was done by Mixer and Barr in 1932. And uh, the extradural approach was devised by, described by Dr. Lau in 1938. Uh, what we are following now is the modification of what uh, Dr. Lau introduced in 1938. After uh, the introduction of microscope by Dr. Yazagir in 1967, it was further re refined. And um, at the same time, Casper uh, devised his own techniques. So what I want you to see here is all those uh, red, red color, you know, highlighted, all those are neurosurgeons. So the neurosurgeons did have a good uh, contribution uh, for interlaminar approach. Uh, maybe because we neurosurgeons, we deal with brain and spine, spinal cord, and uh, we want to see what we are cutting. So neurosurgeons got involved from the beginning uh, in, in interlaminar approach. Here, can you distinguish, can you distinguish between which is uh, microlumbar discectomy and which is endoscopic discectomy? Um, the left one is microscopic discectomy and the right one is endoscopic discectomy. That is two centimeters in size and this is one centimeter in size, not a big, big difference. So my talk today is not to tell you about the size of the incision or the muscle dissection alone. It is something different. It is something uh, completely a different concept of approaching the disc um, uh, through a different corridor. Dr. Potiban did, did uh, 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 mention about, about uh, that transforaminal approach and that's what I'm going to talk today. So the endoscopic uh, spinal surgery has been in the work. What is the big deal? Dustandu has introduced lots of uh, you know, endoscopic techniques. Uh, lots of tubular retractors are in the market. So what is the big, big difference? All these techniques have been, um, you know, dealing only with the interlaminar approach. Uh, we all know if we go through the interlaminar route, we split the muscles and uh, we reach the uh, uh, ligamentum flavum, uh, just uh, put it open, uh, enter the epidural space, retract the nerve root and reach the disc. But what I'm going to talk today is um, a four lateral approach where we do not disturb all these normal structures. We are going to come from uh, a far away route, from a uh, lateral route to reach the disc um, uh, to the foramen or extra foraminal in case of extra foraminal disc. Who is the better spinal surgeon? Neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon? This uh, contest has been going on, but for the transforaminal route, the contribution was mainly done by the orthopedic surgeon. Maybe because as I already told you, the neurosurgeons, we want to see and cut, but the orthopedic surgeons have, have pioneered this technique. They, they introduced a, a needle through the trans, you know, from the four lateral route into the nucleus pulposus from which they totally, they innovated, gradually they innovated various techniques and, and uh, uh, finally they have, uh, they're quite successful recently. Of all these names, I want you to concentrate on Parvez Kambin, who has developed this technique and also defined the anatomical landmark for safe entry zone. In those days, the surgeons who make big incisions were called bigger surgeons. And later it changed to the surgeons who made smaller incisions were called bigger surgeons. But Particularly, the transforaminal route started from a small needle and from which they innovated quite a few um, uh, technology to get where we are today. So he, he, he is uh, Professor Campbell and he devised this, uh, this uh, uh, triangle for safe entry of the needle. Uh, you can see the hypotenuse is uh, formed by the exiting nerve root and um, the base is formed by the upper end plate of the lower, lower vertebra and the height is formed by the traversing nerve root or dura. Usually that is masked by the ascending facet. So this is the safest entry zone. So 
you have to go away from the hypotenuse to reach the safest uh, entry zone into the nucleus pulposus. As Dr. Parsons mentioned, everything started with uh, with uh, the nerve root blocks and also by from nucleoplasty. So this is a percutaneous technique where the needle is passed through the Cambian triangle. See, it is going oh, just yeah. around the nerve. Longer, maybe. Yeah. 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 Softer. I mean, what and, and it is entering into the And the last, last picture shows the contrast being delivered into the epidural space through the forum. So from that needle, quite a few innovations have been made. The endoscopes are made with a wider working channel. The the Bevel ended tubular access cannula is an innovation. The bevel end helps to retract the nerve roots, and um, the total width of the cannula is uh, around eight millimeter only. And um, the endoscopes are having multiple channels, wide angle lens, high definition cameras, various drills and refines, um, vari variable tip angle and articul articulated instruments. They have all made uh, they've all made the surgery quite successful and the last one the radio frequency ablation is a um, quite um, um, a nice one to do we didn't there is no need to use bipolar we can use this radio frequency ablator to cauterize i will show it in my video so this is can you see my video yeah So this is our operative uh, room organization. The C arm should be on the other side of the side of interest. Here we are operating on the right side. So we are using reverse spine. The monitor should be on the opposite side. So instrument port, light source, and irrigation port are all seen. Here I want you to concentrate on these two lines the posterior facetal joint line and the interspinous line. The interspinous line is the tip of the spinous process and posterior facetal line is along the posterior uh, part of the, spine, uh, the facets. So if you go anterior, enter anterior to the uh, posterior facet line, there is a risk of entering into the peteroneal cavity and also a risk of injuring the kidneys. So you have to go behind the posterior facetal line and in the AP view also, you have to concentrate on squaring the end plates. Here, the end plates are squared and then only the needle is advanced. So you can clearly see the posterior facet line and the interspinous line. This is the posterior facet line. So the needle is in and now the K wire is passed. So we are within the nucleus pulposus. This has to be done in AP position only. Now the cannula is, the trochar is passed first. Once the trochar reaches the nucleus pulposus, which is advanced in the AP view, the cannula is passed. From the far lateral approach. I understand the midline is far away. I want you to understand that midline is far away. We are coming from the far lateral route. Once the cannula is in, the trocar is withdrawn. And now we are seeing the endoscopic view. So we are within the nucleus pulposus now. So in this technique, you know, we are reaching the pathology first. We are not at all dealing with the normal structures like um, the nerve roots or the epidural fat. We are dealing with the pathology first. And uh, toward the end, we will see the ligamentum, sorry, the postural lunch ligament and the rent in the postural lunch ligament. And finally, we will see the epidural space and the nerve root. So this is the radio frequency ablated I was mentioning. I think you have started to see 
the PLL now. The abdominal fat is seen now. So this is the scissor which cuts the posterior lunchroom ligament. So at the end, you are seeing the nerve root free of compression. So what are the advantages of this transforaminal discectomy? This route is um, transmuscular. In result, epidural and neural veins are protected. The epidural scar tissue is prevented, uh, prevented as there is no handling of the neural structures or the epidural vessels. There is no or minimal bone removal. The connective tissues and ligaments, such as ligamentum flavum and PLL, are protected. The paravertebral muscle retraction is not performed in this approach. And as a whole, the supportive and connective tissues are preserved in postural approach. And so the risk of disc herniation recurrence is less than the middle approach. In case of recurrent disc herniation, middle approach is fresh if you contemplate redo surgery. But this technique is not without complications. The minor complications are transient dysesthesia, hyperesthesia along the nerve root handle. Infection and hematoma formation, they're quite rare. Dural tear and late recurrence can happen. Major complications like injury to the exiting nerve root, cauda equina injury, major vessel injury, injury to the abdominal viscera, mainly the kidney, and increased ICP due to the pressure exerted by the irrigating saline have all been reported. What are the limitations of this technique? There is a steep learning curve. Mastering the endoscopic anatomy and techniques is mandatory. The instruments are quite long. They are around more than 25 millimeter, in, uh, sorry, centimeter in length. So if they're quite long, so um, they may break while you handle it the, for the first time. So you have to be very careful when you, when you use it. The iliac crest, when it is high, we cannot approach uh, that through this approach, for lateral approach usually, because it is on the way. So you have to adopt for interlaminar approach. Migrated disc, what do you do sometimes, you know, with the uh, experience you have started, we have started doing migrated disc with this technique, but for the beginners, it may be difficult. As a goal, there is, as a whole, there is a quite steep learning curve. So the final question, transformation from micro lumbar discectomy to the endoscopic discectomy, discectomy, is it worth the hard work? And my answer is yes. Thank you. I, I would like to thank you, Dr. Divya, and the organizers for giving me this uh, fantastic opportunity to talk in this forum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vijay, sir, for the wonderful talk and uh, telling us about the evolution of a needle to an endoscope. And um, it's, it, it was a nice talk. So thank you so much for... Uh, being present here and uh, Divya, this, I I like, a, Dr. Anil, Divya, uh, yeah, please. I have a quick question for Dr. Vijay. Dr. Vijay, which endoscope, which company endoscope do you use? Reverse spine, Richard Wolf. Which one? I'm sorry, Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf. Okay, Richard. thank you so much. Yeah, you can introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Anila. Okay. So, um, our next speaker is, yeah, so our, uh, Dr. Kantha Rasalingam is not here, Divya, because he's the next speaker? No, no, he is yeah, there, he's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's in the panel. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Kantha Rasalingam, uh, he, he is a senior consultant neurosurgeon in General Hospital Kuala Lumpur. He is also the Vice President of Neurological Association of Malaysia with a special interest in spine surgery and he will be giving us our next talk uh, which is on uh, MIS in Lumbar Canal Stenosis. Dr. Rasalingam, you can uh, do your share screen please. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, can you all see? Yeah. Yes. Uh, good evening everybody. Welcome. Uh, I mean... Thanks for giving me the chance uh, to present. I'm from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and my topic today is on MIS as for lumbar canal stenosis. So, goal of minimally invasive spinal surgery is to achieve outcomes 
equivalent to those of open surgery while minimizing muscle dissection, disruption of ligaments, attachment sites, and collateral damage of soft tissues. So the reduction in trauma has been shown to reduce immediate negative effects, such as pain and toxicity. However, from what our esteemed speakers previously have said, the long-term outcome has not been clearly demonstrated. So uh, minimally invasive spine surgery offers several advantages uh, over open surgery, which typically, which typically requires large incisions, muscle stripping, more anesthesia, a long hospital stay, and a long recovery recuperation period. So in, in short, these are the benefits. Uh, a few tiny scars instead of one large scar. Uh, however, if you look at it, sometimes, uh, you know, when you are doing MIS, that you have got multiple uh, scars. But if you actually add them together, they, they might be actually longer than the one scar in the conventional surgery. Uh, Shorter hospital stay, uh, a few days instead of a few weeks, or maybe a, for a week. Reduced post-operative pain, shorter recovery time, uh, less blood loss during surgery, and reduced risk of infection. So I will be talking about the overview of lumbar canal stenosis, uh, the incidence, pathophysiology, and the types. And then I will go into the management of lumbar canal stenosis and the um, MISS techniques uh, for lumbar canal stenosis, which will include microscopic and endoscopic. So, uh, lumbar canal, spin, uh, spinal canal stenosis uh, is, a is a degenerative lumbar spinal stenosis, describes a condition in which there is diminished space available for the neural vessel elements in the lumbar canal. Uh, secondary to degenerative changes in the spinal canal. So, as we all know, sorry. So, as we all know, the pathogenesis uh, is a disease involving the disc, the superior inferior vertebral body, and the facet joint. So, any of this pathology, when they have got, uh, when when they they have uh, uh, degeneration, they could uh, cause a decrease in the space, which would cause stenosis. The facet uh, begin to degenerate by developing sino, synovitis, and this is the facet capsule, uh, which causes greater spinal motion, which in turn will cause degeneration of the disc with osteophyte formation. So osteophytes can stabilize the motion segment, but can also narrow the spinal canal. So osteophytes on the superior art creating facet narrow the lateral recess and osteophytes on the inferior articular facet narrow the central canal. So as you can see here, so this is the cross section uh, over the L4 uh, vertebral body. And as you can see, uh, these are the, the, the main structures. Okay, vertebral body, this is the pedicle. This is the superior articular uh, process of L4, inferior articular process of L3 and the transverse uh, processes. So as you can see, any structure around here, will, if, if there is some amount of degenerative changes, can cause uh, lumbar canal stenosis. So how do we classify lumbar canal um, uh, stenosis? Uh, you have got central, uh, it could be central, it could be lateral. Uh, lateral would, would, would involve the lateral recess, or it could be foraminal or extra foraminal. So as you can see here, okay, this is the central herniation. This is the paracentral or paramedian herniation. This is the foraminal and extremely lateral will be the extra foraminal. So what do the patients normally present with or what are the clinical symptoms? Typically patients present with back pain, they can have, but of course the most uh, common uh, uh, presenting complaint would be intermittent neurologic uh, claudication. Sometimes they can have buttock pain, posterior type pain, dermatomal radio radiculopathy, myelopathy, or they could even have a neurogenic bowel or bladder involvement. So, of course, once we, we, we have the symptoms, we go to uh, we do the MRI. And so, of course, by diagnosis, if the mid uh, surgical diameter is less than 10 millimeter, it constitutes lumbar canal stenosis. 
in the MRI, we can also look, uh, there could be a loss of this height. We could also see osteophytes. There might be, uh, we have to look for facet joint atrop atropathy and effusion as well, and see whether there's any spondylolysis. And if there's a translation of more than five millimeters or rotation more than 10 to 15 degree on dynamic, uh, on, on, on dynamic um, studies, that will show uh, or point to instability. Another one that, another sign that we can look for is redundant nerve root sign. So as you can see here, the pointing to the redundant nerve root and around it, you can see a lot of tortuous uh, vessels. So this is the redundant nerve root sign. So what do we do? How do we treat it? So I think even the speakers before me had mentioned, um, we only offer treatment for symptomatic lumbar canal stenosis. We start with the basics, which is physiotherapy, uh, painkillers, and if that doesn't work, then we give patients epidural steroid injections. And finally, if there's, uh, even all this fails, then we, 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 we work with the patient. Uh, we, we counsel them for surgery. And um, um, then we will be, we either, you know, we, we, we normally choose between an open or a uh, MIS surgery. So, the surgical uh, choices we have open or MISS uh, surgery or fusion or non fusion. So, as you, these are the few of, the, the, uh, of what literature has uh, put it. Minimally invasive surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis uh, taken from the European Journal of General Orthopedics in 2016, um, published by Walter A. Mojan and Niels. Vandergaard, they conclude that surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis can be performed in a micro decompression fashion without standard instrumented fusion or an interspinous process device for equal or better clinical outcomes against lower cost. So I'll just go through a few more. Uh, most of the, these are the uh, quite new studies. And also this, this study um, in Neurosurgery Volume 80, 2017, uh, lumbar spinal stenosis associated with degenerative lumbar spondylolisthesis. Uh, it says in patients with uh, LSS and DS, minimally invasive decompression is associated with lower reoperation and fusion rate, less slip progression, and greater patient satisfaction than open surgery. Medical decompression for patients with predominant radical pain has been shown to occur the most beneficial long-term outcome. Additional instrumentation could be added in patients with history of back pain and those with disc and facet joint degeneration with associated spondylolisthesis at the index level. More long-term studies are needed to assess the benefit of MIS techniques. A, a publication in the Asian Spine Journal by Seung Yup Lee and Tae Huan update by review of literature. Patients with symptomatic stenosis may present with one or more of a combination of axial pain, radiculopathy, and neurogenic claudication. The long-term outcome of patients with lumbar canal stenosis treated conservative was equal, equivalent to the patient treated surgically. Decompressive surgery is the gold standard for treatment of central or lateral recess lumbar stenosis. Addition, Additional fusion is required if there is associated instability. Resection of more than 50% of the facet joint, degenerative spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, kyphosis, and previous decompression at the same level. So this is another interesting uh, presentation uh, on unilateral... Sorry. on unilateral laminectomy for bilateral decompression, ULBD. So this was presented uh, by uh, the, in the efficiency of unilateral laminectomy for bilateral decompression in elderly lumbar spinal stenosis. And for this, they came up and they said that the indication for this would be mainly lumbar canal stenosis when central or lateral, or it can also be done as a part of decompression for fusion surgery. And the advantage of the unilateral laminectomy 
would be uh, minimally invasive. It preserves the facet joint, inter- and supraspinous ligaments and muscles. Lower reoperation rate for instability. Comparable or better outcome than open decompression. So as you can see here now, the, we can do uh, a bi bilateral decompression by using a MIS technique. So this is a conventional. We go straight in. We add for for the for the 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 the, the site of um, uh, where, where we open, but we can also access the contralateral uh, site using the same opening by a, uh, a slightly um, you know by undercutting our our normal uh, laminectomy site slightly. We can actually access the the contralateral site as well. So as you can see, this is the, the, con the conventional bilateral okay, uh, laminectomy and this is the unilateral. So unilateral uh, um, uh, laminectomy for bilateral decompression. So we only open this part, just the uh, bit of the lamina and we undercut uh, the lamina on the uh, other side as well. So as this is how it used to be before, but now with this, just this opening and sparing the spinous process, we can actually access the other side as well. So the surgical technique, I'll just go very, very quickly um, um, through it. The same position, prone position. Uh, we identify the level of interest using fluoroscopy. Uh, normally, we go about 1.5 to 2 centimeter from the midline for a unilateral, and we can go up to 3 centimeter for bilateral decompression. Uh, we insert a 22 gauge spinal needle and identify this level. Once identified, the skin incision is made, and then we pass it. So this I'm talking about, uh, we are using a, a, a tubular system. So uh, we put in a guide wire, uh, and care must be given that it lies on the lamina of the internal level. So I think our speakers before also have mentioned, uh, it has to be it has to be docked very, very nicely on the, uh, the lamina of uh, the vertebra above. So it should be on the, uh, if we are going on, say, uh, L4, we are going for L, uh, L4, L5, the L4 lamina, it has to be docked on the uh, L4 lamina. Uh, and we, we have to make sure that it be uh, sitting nicely on it and not too medial because we don't want to plunge into the spinal uh, canal. Uh, of course, we introduce uh, serial dilators and, uh, uh, and we, we introduce it one by one. Uh, of course, we co confirm the position using the II. Area is clean and all the soft tissue is removed uh, and lamina is identified. Then we take off the, the, uh, the inferior part of the uh, lamina uh, until we can see the, uh, the attachment of the ligamentum flavor. So we, we take off as much as we, we need to. Uh, and then we start taking off the um, uh, ligamentum flavor uh, using carison of uh, different sizes, carison uh, one and two. Uh, and the extent of laminectomy is determined by uh, whether we want to do a unilateral or bilateral. So if we want to do a unilateral, we just stick to that side. Uh, if we want to do bilateral, we finish the side that we are working on first. And then once we've done that, we can actually uh, tilt the bed. Sometimes we tilt the bed a little bit so and adjust our microscope so that we're able to see the other side. Uh, so these are the, I mean, these are the surgical uh, uh, incision that we make. Uh, normally, it's about 2.5 uh, uh, centimeters. Uh, yeah, and then as we can see, all the, the nerve root is the cranial part and the coral part. And uh, this is the tubul uh, tubular uh, traction system that we use. So as you can see, A is the conventional if you're going to do a unilateral. Uh, but if you want to look, go into the contralateral, we probably need to tilt it a little bit. So we, we might have to uh, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the incision could be at least about maybe 2.53 centimeter away from the midline. Uh, sometimes we also use endoscopic assisted decompression. Uh, we, uh, we, we put in an endoscope uh, to help us to, to for better visualization. Uh, visualization. Uh, but most often, a simple microscope is enough. As you can see, we are very well, uh, we have taken up all the medium flavor, uh, very nice. Uh, decompression. 
And this is the view uh, when we are using endoscope. It gives us sometimes a better view, uh, in, especially in areas which we are not able to see uh, quite clearly with the microscope. So in conclusion, uh, lumbar canal stenosis is a common cause of back pain in elderly. As survival age increases more and more of this disease will be apparent in clinical practice. Surgery is offered in those with persistent and worsening clinical symptoms on, and failed medical management. Instability is the major concern in lumbar spine decompression surgery. Hence, MIS techniques in lumbar spine decompression offers a good alternative to open decompression with preservation of stability, <laughs> motion, and good clinical outcomes. <laughs> Various MIS techniques are available. It all depends on the surgeon's preference. Uh, MIS techniques provide the steep learning curves as mentioned before as well. And these techniques provide safe and good outcome in trained, hand, in trained hands. Thank you very much. I would like to thank um, uh, Divya and the team for inviting me. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. We need some, some questions here, some discussion. Sure. Yeah, this, this is my basic question. That, um, does, does the tibial retractors preserve the multifidus muscles? Sorry? Does the tibial retractors preserve the multifidus muscles? Uh, I, mean, from, I mean, my from my experience, because we're not really uh, cutting the muscle, so I, I feel that it, it preserves the muscles. Yeah, this is, a, this is an amazing thing which I've been thinking for a long time. Uh, I've seen the surgeons who are doing the tubular uh, retractor after, after inserting and going up to the lamina. Uh, usually they do scrap and then and to get into the window of the interlamina. Space. Now, uh, what's happening? What's happening to the multifidus muscle there? Because it's a claim that tubular retractors do not do not destroy the multifidus muscle. This is for Dr. Nader and Dr. Dr. Kanta also. Maybe the other surgeons who are using this technique. Well, I mean, as I, as I say, hello. Yeah, 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 Dr. Kanta. I mean, yeah. okay, yeah. I mean, because. Um, I, I, I feel that, you know, because we are not really um, cutting the muscles. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think so that, 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 you know, there is actually any, uh, we do not really destroy the multifidus muscles. I, I, is there any, any paper to suggest otherwise, uh, Dr. Patipan? Yeah, I, 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 because, you know, I've been thinking about it because uh, uh, I've seen surgeons uh, after reaching the, uh, the lamina, uh, the, the, the the movements which is being done to to reach the to, to dock it, you mean to dock interlaminar space? Yeah. It, it obviously, it obviously take over the superior cell. Obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we will not get the exposure of, of the kind which is being shown in the through the tubular uh, retract. Yeah. Doctor Kam. Yeah. I think yeah. Doctor Nada's uh, opinion because. Um, yeah. Many, many times, because I discussed this matter with uh, many, many surgeons, um, you know, when, when we use the multifidus is a very strong muscle, but it has a multiple connection, not one level, it connects to three level, four level. So we, uh, when we operate at one level, for example, one day at L4, L5, dissecting, dissecting that region, does it, is it, that is going to change the, uh, the, 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 the muscle's uh, potential. I'm talking about clinically. I mean, uh, for me, I think, uh, I mean, that, that the tubular system would be a better system as opposed to our conventional because, I, I mean, of course, you are going to, to disturb the muscles. I mean, there is, if you say, even by just uh, you introducing the system, you're not going to destroy, I mean, or uh, injure the, the muscles, then I think it's... Uh, I mean, there definitely be some muscle injury, but I think the extent of muscle injury is much less. So I, yeah, that's what I feel. Great. Uh, can we go on? Uh, yeah. Can we uh, can we go to the next uh, speaker then? Yeah, please. Uh, 
Okay, so our next speaker is, uh, we were supposed to have Dr. Farooq Bashir from Lahore, Pakistan, but unfortunately is unable to make it. So Dr. Ammar Dogar, who is also an orthopedic surgeon from the Gurki Trust Hospital and a spine surgeon from Lahore, Pakistan, will be joining us. And he will be talking about placement of percutaneous pedicle screws. Dr. Ammar, can you please go ahead and do the slide share? I hope you can all see my slideshow. Yes, we can. Okay. So I am Dr. Amal Dogar and I am working as an orthopedic and spine surgeon at Khurki Trust Teaching Hospital. And the topic of my discussion will be uh, percutaneous pedicle screw fixation. So the objectives of my talk are uh, to tell you about the indications and techniques of percutaneous pedicle screw fixation and to know the limitations of this technique. Coming to the history, internal spinal fixation at the time of fusion was first described by Tourney in 1943 and King in 1944. First pedicle screws were used in 1959 by Boucher. Roy and Camille then first used pedicle screws being connected to a dorsal plate. The first system using both screws and hooks connecting them with the rod were used by Cottrell and De Bousset. The anatomy of a typical vertebra consists of the anterior column as well as the posterior column. So the anterior column consists of the vertebral body which is connected by a pedicle to the spinous process and then the lamina. From the lateral view, we have the vertebral body at the front and then the transverse process, the spinous process and we can also appreciate the superior articular process as well as the inferior article process. Now, the pedicle is a strong bridge between the anterior and the posterior columns. It has a strong shell of cortical bone and a core of cancellous bone. We should be familiar with three terminologies to place a pedicle screw. The first one is the transverse pedicle width. This is important to know about the size of the screw. Then we have the transverse pedicle angle. This is important for us to know about the medial and lateral trajectory that we can have. And then we have the sagittal pedicle angle. This is important for our cranial as well as caudal trajectory. The widest part pedicles are at L5 and the narrowest are at T5 in the horizontal plane. The widest pedicles in the sagittal plane are at T11 and the narrowest are at T1. This slide shows angles for freehand pedicle screw instrumentation. And you can very well appreciate that different angles in the sagittal and the transverse plane are shown vertebra by vertebra for freehand pedicle screw instrumentation. For placing the percutaneous pedicle screws, pre-operative assessment is important and we need to have a high quality anteroposterior and lateral radiographs of the lumbar and thoracic spine, as well as an axial CT at the level of the pedicle.
The minimally invasive percutaneous pedicle screw placement was first described by Magrell in 1977. Newer sophisticated techniques were introduced by Foley in 2002. Over the passage of time, newer advances have taken place and we now have fluoroscopic navigation, city navigation and robotics. And these all gives us the advantages of less blood loss, less post-operative pain, less muscle dissection and post-operative weakness, shorter hospital stay, as well as early mobilization. So coming to the technique of placing a percutaneous spectacle screw, you can all very well appreciate this radiograph showing a fractured vertebra. This is L3 vertebra and uh, ideally we should have a CT scan as well to classify it. But this was an A4 fracture of the L3 vertebra. Hello. Coming to the markings, we have these horizontal lines. These are marked under the image intensifier guidance and this marks the pedicle level. This central line is over the spinous process. This line is over the pedicle and this dotted line which is 4 cm lateral to the mid line is marked as our starting point. Now this slide is very important. You can appreciate AP view of the spine and these three points, the red dotted points are important, the A, B and C points. Now the A point is the lateral edge of the pedicle, the B point is the middle of the pedicle, whereas the C point is the medial edge of the pedicle. We have to start at the A point, which is the lateral end of the pedicle. Under the image intensifier guide, we start through this point and place the trocar here. We insert up to point B and stop here. Then we have to see the lateral view. If on AP view we are at point B and on the lateral view our trocar is beyond the pedicle and into the body, this means that we are fine. But if due to any reason we are at point B and still our trocar is not at point, uh, is not in the body on the lateral view, then we need to rethink because we might be in the canal, which can be dangerous. Here you can appreciate that uh, afterwards we can move it from B to C as we confirmed on the lateral view. Afterwards, we are going to replace the trocar. Uh, we are going to place a guide wire and then place a tube over it. Then we are going to tap over the guide wire. We have, have to tap up to the mid half of the body. We are not going to go beyond this because afterwards our wire will become loose and it may be retracted with this tab and uh, placing a wire will be difficult the next time. So in this image you can see that after tapping we can insert the screw of the desired length. This is the AP view and 
here we can see that the screw has been placed. There are now these is the post uh, operative picture at the end of the surgery and uh, you can see six screws placed three on either side. This is at the end of the surgery, the lateral view and uh, the rod has been placed and the innies have been tightened. And you can appreciate that the fractured vertebra has somewhat maintained its height. This is the AP view and you can see the placement of the screws as well as the rods. This is the picture at the end of the surgery and uh, only one stitch is required for closure of each wound. Each wound is 1.5, 1 to 1.5 centimeter. Now the agents of this surgery are fluoroscopy, neuromonitoring, as well as the CT navigation. But these are not mandatory. This is a paper that was published in Asian Spine Journal in February 2016 and uh, it was on percutaneous transpedicular fixation, the technical tips and pitfalls of sextant and pathfinder. And it concluded that fluoroscopy guided percutaneous pedicular screws are feasible and can be safely done. The advantages of this were told by a paper which was published in Clinical uh, Journal of Neurosurgery in 2015. And the results of this meta-analysis was that percutaneous approach was associated with a shorter operative duration and hospital stay and also had reduced intraoperative blood loss as well as the infection rates. Now we have advantages, but also there are a few complications associated with this technique. These are the intraoperative complications, the early postoperative complications, and the late postoperative complications. The intraoperative complications are the guide wire rupture, the abdominal aortic injury, and the cerebrospinal fluid leakage. The early post-operative complications are the medial or lateral wall fracture of pedicle by malpositioning of the screw or combined medial and lateral wall fracture or poor reduction of the vertebra. Late post-operative complications are screw breakage, plug screw fall off, connecting rod loosening, infection, This slide shows the classification of the pedicle violation. In grade one, the pedicle is replaced by the screw. In grade two, less than two mm of the cortex is breached. And in grade three, more than two mm of the cortex is breached. This slide also shows the uh, grading. So this is the complication that I was telling you before, the guide wire breakage. If there is a breakage of a guide wire, then it is very difficult to remove it. So we can put the screw over it and leave the guide wire as such. We can also have poor reduction. To counter this, we can put a screw in the fractured vertebra as well. Screw breakage is comparatively a late complication as these are cannulated screws, so there are chances of screw breakage. There can be plug loosening. This can be uh, occurring at the time of surgery 
or later on due to infection or loosening. And then as with every kind of surgery, we can have infection and screw loosening. In this picture, you can see that there this is a local kind of infection and this CT scan shows the loosening of the screws. So coming to the end of the talk, the message is that percutaneous pedicle screw fixation is a valid and beneficial option, but it needs a steep learning curve as was told by previous speakers. Thank you all. Dr. Anila, you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Amar. It was a wonderful uh, talk. And uh, okay. I think we'll move on to the next speaker. Yeah, we'll move on to the next speaker. And if anybody has questions, please put it on the chat. And uh, the speakers who have already finished can uh, keep on answering your queries on the chat. So our next speaker is Dr. Salman Sharif. I hope he has joined us. Dr. Salman, are you here? Yep, I'm here. Excellent, fantastic. Dr. Salman needs no introduction. He is like one of the top neurosurgeons of Pakistan. He is, uh, has a special interest in spine surgery, minimally invasive spine surgery. He's the president of the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons, president of the Middle Eastern Society of uh, Spine, uh, as well as the chief uh, surgeon at Liaquat National Hospital, uh, Pakistan. Uh, he is going to be presenting the learning curve in the minimally invasive spine surgery. Dr. Salman, please start sharing your screen. Okay, guys, can you see this clearly? Yes, we do. Okay. Yes. All right, great. So thank you, uh, Anila, and thanks uh, ACNS for especially women in neurosurgery for organizing this. It's wonderful to be here. I'm sorry, I thought I was another um, hour later, but it's okay, it's fine. I just woke up 20 minutes ago, so I was having an afternoon nap. Um, anyway, um, so let's start. I think MIS is now a big deal these days. Uh, and nearly everybody is trying to catch on into it. It's, the, we know that anything that comes in new has got a, a initial period when there is all happy period and everybody is doing it big time, starting new things. But slowly and gradually, we realize there are some things which um, we should not put our hands into and there are some things which, yes, it's possible that you're able to do new things in a better way. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the learning curve for MIS uh, surgery. Well, um, the spine treatment milestones are basically back in 84 when Dick and Kluger got together and uh, described uh, uh, more than 30 years ago uh, the design and the modern pedicle screws. And Megrel joined him from Switzerland, so all of them were uh, pioneers in pedicle screw surgery. And, you know, history of MIS really can't be completed without Foley and Smith beginning the modern era of MIS when they described their tubular microendoscopic discectomy in 1997. And now, the slowly and gradually, it's been routinely applied to a spectrum of degenerative spinal conditions. Now, herniated discs are routinely done, stenosis is routinely done this way, the thesis instability, and recently deformity and other formats are also addressed via MIS. So the concept of any surgery and uh, MIS surgery is performing surgery. We need to access a, sur a surgical target deep inside the body. There is a surgical path, approach is created and uh, is approached, surgery is performed and the surgical path is closed. Despite following normal anatomical paths, surgeons destroy normal and functional tissues. We know this and we leave scar behind, which could be functionally in inactive. So footprints are left behind, just like you know, on beaches, sometimes we leave some of the footprints behind. Um, surgery concept is basic, again, same, smallest footprint. So you know, on, on one side, as you were showing earlier, we could have something like this. On the other side, you could have something completely open. Um, 
still there are indications for open surgery, just like, you know, I was doing a surgery yesterday, as somebody who's had three previous surgeries, infection, and everything is uh, mocked up. There's a lot of bony uh, extra formation, and all that needs to be decompressed appropriately. And if you've got multiple levels, then it's not possible to do all that MIS. So there are indications for open surgery still there. Um, it's uh, MIS is keyhole surgery. You're, what you're doing is trying to use natural planes, so leaving significantly less fingerprints, if at all possible. Why MIS? Uh, we've, you know, uh, this has been this debate has been going on a long time, but we know that there's minimal neural retraction. There's contralateral anatomy could be preserved if you're doing doing one side. Um, shorter hospital stay. We know this is proven. Minimal postoperative pain and earlier return to normal activity has been shown and confirmed. Economic benefits in some ways, well, we are reducing infection and uh, obviously pain early recovery could also play a role. Uh, having said that, if you have less revisions as well, then obviously um, then economically it could be beneficial as well. So what is learning curve? The concept of learning curve was originally introduced uh, back in 1936 by Wright in the aircraft manufacturing. And he described a basic theory for costing the repetitive production of airplane, airplane assemblies. The term was introduced in medicine in the 80s, mainly after the advent of an minimally invasive surgery, and has been a big deal for us um, over this time. Uh, so can we define it? A simplistic, reproducible method of defining could be time taken or number of procedures an average surgeon needs to be able to perform a procedure independently with a reasonable outcome. Reasonable outcome means the outcome may be the same as open surgery. And it's very difficult to identify an average surgeon. Somebody could be a brilliant open surgeon, but minimally invasive. They may not comprehend what's hiding behind and if he's trying to do things which are hidden. So what are the factors that affect learning curve? Um, the learning curve may depend on manual dexterity of the individual surgeons, background knowledge, anatomy. If you don't have that, you can't be a surgeon. The experience of supporting surgical teams. So you may introduce MIS, but your surgical team is unaware of it. You're going to have a lot of problems. Frequency of procedures performed. So the more you perform, the better it is. A new technology does not always apply to all cases. So it's very, very important for us to know. Uh, recently, Roger, Roger Hartle, who's here in, in this session as well, uh, has suggested and proposed that we should try to do every case MIS, even you're talking about uh, starting from tumors to this to anything. And if you do that continuously, obviously your um, colleagues and the people around you in the theaters, they all could improve the way things are done and you yourself could, your um, learning curve is very, is not there at all. And you're able to think, do things that normally you are not able to do. So they suggested we should do more and more of these. So training on inanimate trainers and uh, animal tissue has been shown to facilitate the pr process of learning. And now we do this routinely. In fact, uh, in, with our World Spinal Column Society, we uh, perform about eight to 10 workshops involving um, animals as well as inanimate uh, trainers uh, during the sign. And all this simulation uh, has come into play during this time as well. The presence of structured training schemes and mentoring are very important factors and they should not be forgotten. A uh, slope of a learning curve depends on the nature of the procedure. So learning curve for MIS is longer than for open procedure. Well, there have been multiple studies and studies have shown that when inexperienced subjects are given equal training uh, in laparoscopy and open surgery, the overall skill acquired were similar in both methods. And recently it's been shown in MIS spine as well that even inexperienced surgeons were able to do things, and by inexperience, I do not mean that you know they have, that was their first case. Up to 30 to 40 cases, if they've seen and done, they were able to perform with uh, some kind of reasonable result as good as MIS. So complication rates are inversely proportional to the volume of workload. So you may be a brilliant surgeon, but if you are doing five surgeries a month versus somebody who's doing uh, 20 surgeries a month, obviously your outcome and your uh, know-how and complication tackling will be completely different. So we know this and this has uh, been shown in other uh, specialities as well. So as the surgeons become more experienced, there is a trend also to take on more challenging cases, which, which could again affect the outcome in, the, in an adverse manner. So you may be doing excellent 
um, simple MIS cases, but when you're trying to do new things and getting your colleagues to push and do stuff which is complicated and difficult even in open surgeries, then obviously you could cause uh, more adverse effects. So limitations and contribution uh, that may contribute to a steep learning curve could be if you don't know your anatomical landmarks. So you may have a person who understands everything very well in an open surgery, but in closed surgery is not aware of the landmarks on the image intensifier and do not understand that. Um, so mystery attributed complications during the microendoscopic discectomy learning curve to unfamiliar uh, unfamiliarity with endoscopic image orientation and suboptimal approach uh, to the surgical target. Injury to neurological structures are were shown in, in initial phase in lots of studies. Multiple durotomies were shown in the initial phase. And we know the reason why that people were not aware what they were seeing on the image was really a dura and not uh, a structure that they could remove. Uh, wrong level procedures are done, and many a times MIS are done. But you know, you've got a lot of imaging going on, but as long as it's the same basic principle are going to apply, and again, again, your understanding of your anatomy and understanding of your images are very, very important before you start any surgery. So you may have done 1,000 cases, but if you're doing 20 a day, and I know people who do perform lots of surgeries a day, and uh, in, in their cases, obviously, now and again, they come across a problem when they're not thinking in the line of how to avoid complications for each and every case. And then there is uh, many a times when we're, we can remove a facet joint structure, not knowing this is facet joint and thinking it's abnormal tissue. So all this has been contributed with various studies. So the key step in overcoming the MIS learning curve is ideal entry point if you're talking about um, some kind of uh, tubular dilator that we are putting in and to have the trajectory in the line of the surgical approach. For example, if you're doing endoscopic discectomy, you need to be coming really perpendicular uh, to the disc or wherever the disc is coming out. The sequestra is inferiorly, you come down inferiorly. If you're thinking uh, medially, you come to, uh, to medially. So you, know, you adjust yourself accordingly. So all that can be overcome when we know the anatomy and the pathology of the patient beforehand. So Tall uh, and High asserts that there's a um, correlation between the initial placement of the tubular dilator during the MIS steel F approach uh, to prevent intraoperative readjustments. And we know that we have all been through this that you know, many a times you, you come in, you are, one of your junior has put in a, a tubular dilator and it's not in the place where you want it to be. And you can get away with it, but sometimes you end up uh, changing a bit. It's like, you know, I was doing a cervical disc um, a couple of weeks ago and one of uh, our chiefs had opened up and really had not thought about uh, where the incision was going and was, had just gone on the anatomical landmarks that he thought were right. And he was right on anatomical landmarks, but it was much easier if he would use the image intensifier and make life easier for himself. So I ended up having another parallel incision, but you can do that many a times in MIS as well, it's possible. So how do we measure this learning curve that we are talking about? So it could be patient's outcome or a clinical process or task, task efficiency. Um, so common patient's outcome parameters are, you know, incidental incidence of the complications and survival. So if you do a procedure, the number of complications you're going to have, and when you come to a plateau where you say that your number of complications or survival outcome has come to a place where you're this, as same as your open surgery, then you say that's your plateau and that's your learning curve. So if you look at statistical analysis, it's much, much more complicated than just looking at the complications and survival outcome. Hence, many a times we use operating time, the time that we are taking to do open surgery versus uh, MI surgery, and if you can repetitively have the same time with uh, doing minimally invasive surgery. And then period of hospitalization tells majority of the story that, you know, how long did the patient stay? Because really these patients, when you're doing MIS, have less pain than open surgery and um, less discomfort and mobilized early. So if they're staying longer, then definitely there's something that we're doing wrong. So what are the pitfalls of this measurement? There is no ideal measurement of learning curve. Various proxies are used for measuring the learning curve process. While we may agree on how to measure the learning curve, we cannot say how we should compare individuals' progress, particularly when we are dealing with real patients and having real surgeons. So it's very difficult because every surgeon is different. So you may have 
um, a performance which could go up like that and experience which is coming like that. And you know, you could come to a asymptote somewhere here on point C and that's what where you'd like um, yourself to be before you're comfortable that you know your resident or SR or chief is able to do all that that you want to do open surgery and have equally good results without even supervision. Damaged nerves was a big deal. So Nancy Epstein wrote this uh, editorial in Surgical Neurology International and uh, did a review and said that smaller incisions don't necessarily mean better outcome if the surgeon is not familiar with anatomy and exposure. And there is, um, uh, you know, there is no magic about it. Obviously, this is very, very important basics uh, people should understand. Uh, obviously, MIS has caused increased radiation exposure. Recent st studies suggest increased radiation with minimally invasive techniques. And we have shown, shown recently in many studies, so there is a big study out from Cleveland showing that um, they had uh, patients who were having huge dose of uh, radiation and the junior surgeons are having a huge dose. For example, um, one of the case that uh, Richard Assacker in Lille in France uh, showed had 800 shots of um, uh, radiation while having a single level MIST left by junior surgeons. So it's possible, but we do need to understand there'll be high risk of uh, causing serious issues later on to your eyes, um, your thyroid, and cancer-related issues. So all that is important. And this also comes into play that how can we avoid all this radiation while we are doing MI surgery and where is the learning curve? So, you know, minimal amount, number of shots that you need, that also comes into learning curve. Then how many shots are you requiring for a single level MIST lift kind of thing? So you need to understand that, you know, your radiation dose is uh, two to three times the dose here where exactly your X-ray tube is. So if you're standing over here, you would cause serious problems to yourself. The dose is about one over here and goes half up here. And so your, this is the emission area. So you need to understand that standing here may not be the best thing. And if your image is like this, and if you're standing here, that not, may not be the best thing as well. So all this also comes from understanding the learning curve for reducing the radiation. So there's attention to protection. It's very important. So your goggles, your gloves. Nowadays, we are not using the radiation protecting gloves as well. We have realized that we were actually accumulating radiation into our gloves. And while we were doing that, we were causing more radiation to our hands than anything else. And so since then, gloves have gone out the window and we are trying to stay away from radiation as much as possible. Uh, so we use a, a dosimeter routinely. We use stable shields. We use uh, lead, leaded plastic barriers. Nowadays, we try to use double uh, shields for our uh, double shields. By I mean, you have a vest and you have a skirt underneath. And skirt may look very nice on men, but you know, it's in order to avoid radiation, that may be a good way to go because then it doesn't cause problem with the weight at all. So this understanding that where you're going to stand is very, very important. So you need to try to stand away from extra tubers. And that goes for your assistant, that goes for your um, um, uh, scrub nurse, all the other people who are there in theater. They all need to avoid that because you, you know, that all is part of your learning curve, your initial time that you want to be um, away from this extra tube. So you want this distance to be much bigger than the distance on the top. So X-ray tube should be as far down as possible and try to keep it down. And if you have to stand, you know, you're, you try to stand at least three feet away uh, from the X-ray tube. So we do understand this uh, inverse square law, which is scattering around the patient. So if you stand about a meter away from the radiation, then dose comes to one. Whereas if you go down to two meters, it drops down by one fourth. And if you do go down to three meters, it actually drops by one ninth. So actually, uh, it's an exponential um, um, inversely proportion in which the radiation goes down. So you need to understand all these. So these uh, X-ray source um, distance it, it keeps you away from the dose by a factor of four. So you need to try to move as back as possible, uh, if, poss if at all possible. So what is an uh, uh, average learning curve? Um, learning curve, um, um, MIST lift. So this is a friend of mine, uh, Paolo Pereira from Portugal. And uh, he came out, they correlated with a steep learning curve. That's what they call, um, I'm not sure if you can call steep, because by uh, steep we mean which is taking much longer. Uh, it, it was taking about approximately 40 cases 
um, before they were able to uh, have a uniform result. So half of the improvement in the learning curve can be achieved after 12 cases. And 90% of the experts' proficiency level is achieved around 40 cases. So if you've done open surgeries, you understand all that, then it's much easier for you to um, understand the concept. And so, you know, before falling down, you could have brilliant results. So this is from SNI 2017. And obviously, this is the study from Silva in which they showed that, you know, this uh, overall complication was up to 12%. And there was more frequent dural tears in 5% and complications were about 33 and 20. And they showed in their first um, uh, 100, and, um, 100 cases and followed by the rest of the cases. And then they kept showing that the results continued to improve and then plateaued afterwards. So the learning curve, there's a neg negative exponential. That's what they showed that, you know, obviously um, there is a, a, a curve that goes down in the reverse direction. Uh, showing that slowly and gradually uh, the number of cases that you require to have uh, corrected operative time um, keeps on plateauing once you've done um, up to 40 cases. So 90% of the learning milestones is up to 40 cases. When you look at microendoscopic discectomy for lumbar disc herniation and looking at 873 cases, so if you look at this, they showed took early group 220 cases and late group up to 650 cases. And you can see that the operative time improved a lot and blood loss really became half during that time. So when you're doing this and you're trying to do surgeries through a keyhole, you may not be able to have a better control in the initial phase. But when you understand um, the concept of MIS, everything becomes easier and simpler uh, in these patients. And even VAS was better in this group. So comparison of minimally invasive versus open uh, standard microscopic discectomy. So this was a randomized controlled trial uh, that was published in the European Journal of Neurosurgery. And they clearly showed that the, uh, the, and when this was done in experience center versus a transfer center, the results were completely different and showed that eventually the learning curve um, got a caught on to um, just like a referral index center. So operative results and uh, learning curve, microscopic assisted tubular surgery for one or two level discectomies and laminectomies. So this is way back uh, in 2000, 2008. And they showed that we're doing one level and two level, their uh, duration, their outcome, their complications, uh, uh, time period, patient's outcome, everything improved in their second set of phases. So you can see that if you're in the in learning curve kept going down in all these and they were able to come to a plateau uh, slowly. So failure, we know we are built in to make mistakes. Uh, we, there is a code of error in us um, and failure is inevitable. But it's important that you understand um, anything that you before you start to do, what others have done, what they had learned from that. So the comparison of MRS versus open TLS with regards to clinical improvement, fusion rate, and incidence of major complications. Uh, this is general, uh, general European Spine Journal, 2015. They got hold of 14 studies together with 12 months follow-up involving MIS TLF versus um, open TLF. They had similar fusion and complication rates. However, higher revision readmission rates were attributed to deep learning. Curve. They observed that MIS surgeon requires extensive training Experience is necessary, otherwise MIS TLF may yield unsatisfactory results uh, upon patients. So uh, some studies have documented comparable long-term outcome for open versus uh, MIS spinal surgery. So is the learning curve really worth it? This has been discussed many a times, and we know that uh, if you look at this, this is the uh, Nancy Epstein, uh, only four uh, patients are included in this, and later on, um, they had a study with 200 cases showing much better results in that. So complication associated with initial learning curve of MIS, as, uh, this is way back um, um, a study during the 2000s, and they showed the total complication rate was 11%. And the most common complication attributed to MIS was durotomy, while perfusions complications including implant imposition, malposition, uh, instrument-related neural injuries, and non-union were features. Uh, many a times when you're doing MIS TLF, you're trying to compress and you, your compression may not be as good in the initial phase, but now with modern gadgets, you're able to do that. 
So once you know which instruments to use, where to go about, obviously your results could get better and better. So if for um, you know, looking at MIS, uh, for MIS surgery, uh, 20 to 30 cases were required for learning curve of, of TLIF, MIS pedicle stroke, and MIS cervical surgery. Several other studies have described learning curve for MIS going, describing between 10 to 44 cases under supervision. So in conclusion, surgical aptitude, manual dexterity of the trainee and structural um, training are important factors in reducing uh, the learning curve. Now what's happened is with MIS being there from very beginning, unlike when we started out, obviously we didn't have MIS. And so we had to learn all this uh, with various workshops, uh, going to colleagues, learning uh, different stuff, reading a lot. Nowadays, as part of residency program, um, the training of MIS has been there. So their understanding of open as well as uh, MIS surgery um, is much uh, better than for people who started doing MIS in the earlier period. And there was this resistance as well. Uh, would they like to do this or shall they continue with the better results that they were ha having with open surgery? But they really, um, it is worth it because, you know, the more surgeries that you're going to do with MIS, the better you're going to become and the better results you're going to have. And we know that it's excellent for the, for the patients themselves. So facilities for training and practical uh, practice of surgical techniques have an enormous impact. And we understand that as part of uh, many um, uh, spinal uh, societies and more and more um, workshops and uh, forums out there. And so you've got different types of gadgets that you can learn on. And they have a huge impact on the learning curve. It's been shown and we have also shown that. And training of it, trainers and inanimate uh, trainers, animal tissue is vital to improve the result. Uh, it is worth it. Should I be moving from my traditional procedure with fewer complications to relatively new procedure with higher complications during the early cases and increased operating time? And I would say yes. You need to understand this, that you could have a plan, something like this, that you want to go from uh, point A to point B. Dr. Anita understands this very well. Uh, she does a lot of cycling. And here we are in reality. Obviously, you could have uh, a, a scenario like that where you could have fire, you could have water on the way, there was snow. Well, you know, so there is something interesting while you're doing your surgery every day. And you, you need to be ready for that. So just look and enjoy this clip. So this is basically, you, you need to understand, you need to go into the horse from the side and not from the back. Um, so learning of factors, there are surgeons factors, disease factors, uh, training factors, and hospital factors. On all these run into play. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you are. Dr. You are Anila, muted. you're muted. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Simancheri, for a wonderful presentation on the learning curve of MIS. And uh, Divya, I'm going to give it back to you to yeah. present yeah. the speaker. A... And if anybody has any Manas, questions, eh? Sharif, please uh, uh, use the chat to uh, ask your queries. Uh, Manas, sir. Hello, yeah, are you there? Uh, yes, yeah. Sir. Can so you uh, the next speaker in our. Uh, uh, online symposium is uh, Professor Manas Panigrahi. Actually, he's one of the well-known and renowned uh, neurosurgeons, not only in Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh, but also uh, throughout India. And uh, like he's working as a senior consultant uh, neurosurgeon at uh, Kim's Hospital, Krishna Institute of uh, Medical Sciences at Hyderabad, India. He worked as a professor of neurosurgery in the Department of Neurosurgery at Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences. And uh, he does lots of surgeries. And if you see the series, it's uh, very impressive impressive and uh, spine surgeries he has done uh, around more than 1500 cases including cervical and lumbar and he has published around uh, means more than 140 articles in uh, uh, national and international journals and he's a fellow of american college of surgeons and there are uh, he has organized uh, many conferences uh, means uh, like uh, he's very well known and he is uh, very famous so uh, the stage is over to you sir he's going to talk on uh, uh, means olif oblique uh, lumbar interbody fusion uh, thank you, Dr. Divya. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Divya and Dr. Anila. And uh, uh, hello, Dr. Salman. Uh, um, uh, for one and two hours, we have been listening on uh, posterior approaches. And so there's one lecture on anterior. So uh, because uh, when Divya asked, uh, I thought we'll speak something on uh, anterior minimally invasive surgery. Uh, because that is... Uh, uh, that is more uh, 
more rewarding than a posterior approach and uh, it has less uh, unlike uh, the complication rate in posterior where uh, minimally invasive has a higher complication rate in uh, anterior minimally invasive uh, the complication rate are also are quite less so and it's a technique which uh, not only reduces blood loss but also uh, is quite patient uh, friendly and uh, friendly for the surgeons uh no there are a lot of lifts in in spine surgery uh, like a lift is anterior interbody lumbar interbody fusion and p lift is posterior lumbar interbody fusion which uh, dr sarman spoke about or uh, t lift is trans uh, lumbar interbody fusion x lift is extreme lateral interbody fusion o lift is oblique lumbar interbody fusion and there is another term uh, term called o lift where it is an oblique lateral a lumbar interbody fusion uh, i'll be ex explaining each one but i'll be discussing more on only uh, oblique lumbar interbody fusion among this uh, the anterior ones are the a lift o lift and x lift and the posterior ones are tail uh, lift and t lift and o lift uh, in the anterior uh, approach Uh, one does it uh, anterior lumbar interbody fusion is usually it is transperitoneal one does an anterior lumbar interbody fusion whereas in oblique lumbar interbody fusion one does it retroperitoneal in between in between the psoas and the great vessels in x ray one does uh, or d ray it is directly to the psoas muscle so when one does directly to the psoas muscle there is a potential uh, risk of damaging the lumbar plexus in o ray it is Uh, it is an interbody fusion but it is done posteriorly which is done endoscopically uh, uh, through the transforaminal route which is uh, uh, not distinctly coming up and able cases now it is possible to do and till and till uh, is already known now in an open till if or a minimally invasive till if we listen to all the lectures and what are the advantages of of uh, less of blood loss less of muscle damage because we do not strip the muscles we do not uh, devascularize the muscles and uh, so the uh, the uh, the um, pain relief is better and the the tension band also is saved in when one does a minimally invasive surgery but when one does anterior compared to posterior there is a lot of difference when one places an anterior uh, cage the anterior cage what we do in olive is almost three times the size of the posterior cage in a t lift one can only uh, place a cage of uh, uh, 8 to 10 mm height or 22 mm long thickness and that diameter is again 8 to 10 whereas in olive it is three times the size of the of the uh, uh, posterior cages if you compare this is the olive case and this is the t lift case so the surface area is almost three times so biomechanically doing an anterior fusion is far better and has more pain relief than the posterior fusion now anterior fusion can be done by retro, uh, transperitoneal or through retroperitoneal or through the transverse now x lift or d lift is very popular was popular earlier when one does it through the psoas muscle but as one can damage the columbus plexus one has one needs an uh, emg monitoring to avoid emg monitoring one can do with the uh, instead of that one can do a oblique lumbar interbody fusion now these are the lumbar plexus anatomy uh, because one goes to the lumbar plexus in an extreme uh, fusion the extreme lateral fusion the chances the complication rate is almost quite high I mean uh, almost to the extent of 10% though it is transient and some people have told 12% because of paresthesia and sometimes if you are not careful it can also damage the femoral nerve so to avoid this one can use intra monitoring uh, or or do a neurography before to decide to decide the entry point if one looks at this uh, morose zone where zone 1 the body is divided into four zone zone 1 zone 2 zone 3 and zone 4 now the the zone 3 and the zone 4 has a higher incid, uh, incidence of nerve plexus injury because the plexus is posteriorly situated 
So entry in the zone one and zone two has less risk of injury. So if one enters to the left side, zone two has only 5.7% incidence of plexus injury. Whereas in the, on the right side, it is only 8.6% in the zone two. Whereas zone three, four, and five, three and four have a very high incidence of plexus injury. So one has to avoid the zone three and four when one does an extreme lateral interbody fusion. Now, if you look at the lateral X-ray, so this is the ideal entry point when one uh, one has to avoid the zone three and four and always go in a zone one and two. Now, one can do a neurography like this and the neurography and decide where is the lumbar plexus and preoperatively decide which is the entry point. Uh, so this instrument can be used with navigation to decide the entry point and so that I can have less chances of femoral lumbar damage in the, during the procedure. And this is a neurography when we get the femoral nerve here so and have an entry point anterior to the femoral nerve. To avoid entry into the peritoneum, one, one can do, uh, the, the mayor first describe the technique of interbody fusion using retroperitoneal corridor where one can enter, instead of going to the psoas muscle and having a potential risk of damaging the nerves, one can go in front of the psoas and behind the aorta and enter this space, which is the uh, safe zone. So in a pre-op MRI, one has to see that whether there is a safe zone here to uh, decide whether it's a good candidate for oblique interbody fusion. So the MRI shows that there's a good space between the aorta and the border of the psoas muscle, then one can plan an oblique fusion. Otherwise, one should not do an oblique lumbar interbody fusion. Now this, uh, this can be done with a finger injection, just a finger dissection or using an endoscope. Now the advantage of OLIF is one can do it, uh, uh, do the discectomy uh, without entering peritoneum and without damaging the pep, uh, nerve, one need not use a monitoring device also. It can only be performed from L2, L3, L3, 4, L4, 5. The indications are very uh, limited indications, like you have a degenerative disc disease, your spondylolisthesis is grade 1 and 2, or a failed posterior fusion. One, there's a failed posterior fusion doing Again, a tea leaf from back is difficult because the anatomy is lost or scoliosis. <clears throat> I'll give an example of this. This is a failed posterior fusion. Now, one can see here in the MRI that there is a good space, space between the psoas and the aorta. If we find the space is adequate, then one can plan an oblique interbody fusion. Whereas if, if the uh, aorta divides at a higher level the ili ilia, the, the, and we find the iliac arteries, there is no space between this, then one should not do attempt an oblique fusion in, uh, in cases where there is a high uh, bifurcation of the aorta. This is how the patient is positioned on, uh, in, in the lateral position with a break at the lumbar level so that the lumbar space is opened up. Then with the CM, identify the anterior border of the disc and the posterior border of the disc and then project the disc on the surface. Uh, so this is a surface marking of that disc and then either one can enter through the disc or it's better to do it 5 cm anterior to the anterior border of the disc, the incision. So that uh, if one does an extra peritoneal, one, can, one has to do 5 cm anterior to the uh, anterior border of the disc and enter retroperitoneally to at the zone two level. So this is uh, done percutaneously with a small uh, needle where well, first one passes a, passes a guide wire. Over that, the, um, the, 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 the cannulated dissectors. And this is done through an incision which is five centimeter. And after, after one has entered that disc, the tubular retractor, this is the uh, needle to fix the tubular retractor to the upper body. And the discectomy are done with the shavers available. And one has to do from one pedicle to the other pedicle. And if there are osteophytes or syndesmophytes on the opposite side also are broken, so that one can correct the scoliosis. And then the uh, uh, sizer are placed and uh, 
to confirm the size uh, one can place almost uh, the transverse diameter is almost 45 mm or 50 mm uh, uh, diameter uh, of the cage and of a 16 mm uh, height cage and which gives a lodotic angle also one can plan two to four six degrees angle which is not possible in a posterior fusion so the correction of lodosis angle also is better when one does a oblique lumbar interbody fusion. So this is the cage which has the lodotic angle and then one can place bone graft also and it, the, the amount of bone graft is almost three times than what we can use in the posterior fusion. And this is how it looks at the end of the fusion with an AP x-ray. The markers should be in the spine should be coinciding uh, in the midline and the lateral markers should be just beyond the particular line. This is a case of 84 year old, uh, year old gentleman with neurogenic claudication and he had two times for a laminectomy earlier. She came with listesis and this was the uh, with scoliosis with osteoporotic spine. So we had planned initially, uh, we did uh, a lumbar in uh, oblique fusion in the stage one. You can see here at two levels we did an oblique fusion. Uh, that, uh, that corrected that uh, scoliosis to a certain extent and then we did posteriorly a pedicle screw fixation uh, with the O-arm and navigation. Now this is another girl of a 16 year old girl who was a tennis player. She wanted to play tennis after the surgery and uh, she came with bilateral radicular symptoms. She was very obese and uh, so we, we decided to do uh, both uh, olive and in plain x-ray there was instability so we did olive followed by posterior fixation she had two level uh, disc uh, disc prolapse uh, in the scan and after we did the olive we before we uh, went for the percutaneous fixation we did an mri you can see here that the disc height is reduced and the prolapse also the disc compression also has come down significantly just by doing the uh, uh, just by doing the olive procedure and uh, after that on the other day second day we did the uh, the percutaneous fixation this case 3 of a 45 year old man uh, who came with neurogenic uh, claudication and uh, the mri showed black disc uh, he had seen many doctors uh, uh, everybody had suggested uh, conservative treatment for three years he was on conservative treatment and uh, so we uh, in the scan there was a black disc with a retrolysthesis and and foraminal stenosis so we decided to do an olive to just to distract the foramen have a foraminal, uh, restore the uh, foraminal height so we did an olive and we did a fixation and so this was the scan and can, one can see here there are retrolysthesis. If you had done a posterior foraminotomy, that probably would have symptomatically would have been worsened. If you do posterior, then again one has to do tea leaf and posterior and in uh, pedicle fixation, but we did uh, OLE. So in this a failed surgery, so first we did OLE followed by posterior fixation using OAM. And this confirmed. So of all the 17 cases we had done uh, of OLIP, uh, 13 cases were primary surgery, four cases were failed back surgery. And two level surgery, single level surgery was done in 13, uh, two, two level surgery was in five, and pedicle, posterior pedicle fixation was done in nine, and lateral body rods were placed in, in four. And then what did we achieve? Vascular was achieved in five of them, one, zero or five, and uh, three of them had vascular of one and two of them vascular of two. And the significant thing was the restoration of the height and restoration of the foraminal uh, uh, height also. So, and segmental correction of the um, scoliosis also could be corrected. We started operating in 2016, we had two, two years follow up and this is one of the case which was done two years ago. So, good bony fusion also. So what are the advantages? It is It was anterior to the psoas muscles, hence avoids injury to the psoas muscle and lumbar plexus. It is away from the peritoneum, 
so patients can be discharged early and it it and because it's away from peritoneum it doesn't damage the lumbar uh, plexus so the incidence of retrograde ejaculation is not there as what you find in anterior lumbar fusion and direct discectomy and end plate preparation can be done easily the surface area is three times larger than tail lift so it's a better uh, gives a better chance of fusion and lesser incidence of hernia and ileus as it's a muscle uh, splitting rather than muscle cutting surgery uh, thank you for your attention <clears throat> um thank you uh, manas sir uh, means uh, thank you for the uh, means uh, the terminology uh, means that uh, o l l i f and all so actually i was not aware of all this and uh, there are lots of questions that has to be uh, like uh, addressed like uh, we will ask you in the chat because uh, whether once uh, you take out the means when will you plan for posterior and uh, fixation also and uh, when you do the discectomy will you uh, means uh, see the dura or the pll and then what is the posterior element and uh, and like uh, do you uh, have uh, means do you ask another uh, means uh, general surgeon or the neurological surgeon to help you so we have lots of questions but i think we'll put it in chat because of the uh, time limitation that we have okay. Th thank you thank you you know sir thank you thank you so with this i will uh, introduce the next uh, speaker sir uh, can you uh, stop sharing your screen sir yeah yeah thank you uh with the, i mean i introduce the next speaker uh, dr rupesh kumar so he is the uh, means senior consultant neurosurgeon at uh, sims hospital in srm institute of medical sciences in chennai tamil nadu india uh, he was uh, like uh, he was the one who started the neurosurgery department uh, in the jipmer the famous institute in india jipmer and he has trained many uh, residents uh, means uh, means i am also one among them and i'm happy to say that and uh, actually uh, means he was the uh, like uh, it's uh, treasurer of the skull base uh, uh, surgical society of india and he has uh, he hosts many posts and he is going to be uh, the director of the department of neurological oncology and skull base surgery in the southeast asia's first proton beam center very soon in the month of june he is going to become the director so and i welcome uh, dr rupesh kumar uh, to talk on minimally invasive uh, posterior cervical lamino foraminotomy stages over to you sir uh, thank you very much dr divya for uh, giving me this opportunity and i am very much delighted to join again this neurosurgery tv and this acns online symposium um this uh, today i will be covering on the posterior cervical lamina foraminotomy uh, in a minimally invasive technique i think all these other topics were about lumbar and thoracic spine and i think this is more of a cervical spine and i will also Uh, i take this opportunity to touch a brief of the principles of the disc surgery and how it is different from cervical and uh, lumbar disc so if you see the prevalence of cervical disc disease or cervical spine the 36% of all spinal interval disc they collapse and 50 to 60% of adults experience some amount of neck pain and arm pain uh, in their lifetime and the uh, statistics say one fifth of visits to any orthopedician is for cervical discogenic pain and the most common causes uh, most common levels involved are uh, c56 and c67 which approximately amounts to 75% and c7 being the most common nerve root involved this is what the statistics say and this is a significant rise in the number of uh, disease because of cervical disc disease mainly because of the change in the lifestyle as you see there's a new entity which is called the text neck wherein people start using their mobile phones and uh, they get a lot of this degeneration especially in this younger age so the new spine surgeons will have to deal with all this in a more more common way so degenerative cervical disc disease if you see the mri uh, many patients do show some amount of degeneration and 25% of asymptomatic individuals age less than 40 years do have some amount of disease and definitely so in 40 years more than 60% that means that you can see how the incidence is what is the distinction of the main difference between the lumbar spine and the cervical spine disc disease if you see the lumbar radiculopathy the most common cause is lumbar disc disease whereas if you take a cervical spine it is not really so the cervical disc disease accounts only for 20 to 25% of radiculopathy that means what are the remaining causes of this radiculopathy you see that it is mainly the foramen encroachment 
So that is the main topic why I'm choosing this a posterior laminar foraminotomy because the most common cause of cervical radiculopathy is foraminal encroachment, which accounts in 70 to 75 percent of patients. It, this foraminal encroachment could be degeneration of disc, which could be because of anchovertebral joints of Lushka, as you see, or zygo apophasial joints. All these three can uh, cause encroachment and this can cause cervical radiculopathy in these patients. If you see the natural history of any cervical disc disease, 45% resolve spontaneously without any recurrence. And this is a very famous study by Lee and Turner et al. And 30% continue to have mild symptoms, but only in 25%, these symptoms are persistent and progressive, which needs treatment. We have a lot of approaches and the main standard approach for all the cervical disc diseases, the common called ACDF, otherwise called the anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. So it's going, it goes equal and equal and uh, there's a standard procedure which is done in most parts of the countries, elsewhere and in the world for this disease. But this is something in, in contrast to lumbar where we approach it primarily posteriorly. So why not we do that in the cervical spine? It's not possible because we have a cord there. So we cannot retract the cord unlike the lumbar fecal sac. But then we need to address the cervical disc not in the center of the paramedian, it is the foramen. And that is the rationale of this posterior cervical laminar foraminotomy. You see that these are the various types of disc prolapse in the cervical disc. You can see it can be protruded, it can be preligamentous, it can be sequestrated, can be intradural, intrafaraminal, and extrafaraminal. You see this A, B, C, D, E, and F. So, which cases are more suitable for anterior approach? If you see a protruded disc, as you see in picture A and picture B, I think these are the ideal cases for anterior cervical discectomy. Even if you take C, it can be done, whereas uh, D is absolutely by anterior cervical discectomy. You see the picture in E, F, and C. You can also approach these by a posterior laminar foraminotomy. You need not necessarily do it by anterior cervical. So these are the indications where you think about approaching this disease by a posterior approach. Let us see some examples of MRI. You see here, the first picture, it is a central disc prolapse. It has to be approached by anterior. There is no doubt about that. But you see the next picture of a posterior laminar posterior lateral disc prolapse, as you see here, it can be done anteriorly, there's no doubt, but you see here, why you disturb the whole disc to reach this disc prolapse? The rationale is, if you can approach this by posterior, you need not disturb the normal disc, you can just remove the disc which is protruded, because ultimately the symptoms are radiculopathy and you need to remove the symptoms of the patient. So there's a good case for doing a posterior approach in this type of postrolateral disc prolapse without disturbing the normal cervical disc and thereby I'll come to you the advantages of this approach. So you have the left two cases where it is a central disc prolapse which can and only be approached by anterior approach whereas on the right side both above and pitch low pitches one can approach it not only by anterior a good case for a posterior approach. So how to choose the approach? So this is very, very important. It is very logical to approach the cervical spine from the direction where the majority of pathology is. So anterior decompression can be done as I showed you in previous cases, but usually it involves fusion. That's a major drawback. In fact, when you see anterior approach, the posterior, however, does not require fusion. It can stand alone only with decompression. The important question to be addressed when considering an approach, whether anterior or posterior, is whether are you dealing with a spinal instability and how is the cervical lordosis. So, coming to the ACDF, what are the advantages of that? One is the familiarity. So, everybody is trained in this ACDF from their resident days, and it's a very, very comfortable procedure, and one can master it uh, without much learning curve. It has less post-operative discomfort, less pain as you see. Patients are very comfortable in the first post-op day, except for mild dysphagia and hoarseness of voice, if it is a lower cervical spine. And we can achieve bilateral decompression as a major advantage. Not only the central, you can go on the right side, you can go on the left side, and it gives a panoramic view. However, everything comes with a disadvantage. 
So as you see, you are going through vital structures. So there is a risk of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve and veins you have to deal with if they are very uh, short neck. You have to do fusion in majority of cases and you have to think about the graft state complications and the graft related complications. So these are the sum of the disadvantages of conventional anterior cervical decompression and fusion. Coming to the long-term studies, there are much debates going on, but there is a majority, a lot of literature available in this adjacent segment disease when you do anterior cervical discectomy. So when there are studies which shows that up to 2.9 percentage per year per level, the first 10 years, there can be risk of degeneration. Example, you do a C56 disc prolapse, discectomy and fusion, the C45 above or C67 below has a very high risk of under developing a degeneration and 92 percentage of patients over a mean period of 8.6 years need treatment for this type of disc degeneration. So that is the statistics which shows and um, that is a main concern when you fuse a segment. So that is now the concern that whether to fuse or not to fuse in a single level is of major debate. But then that is beyond the scope of this chapter. But one need to understand that there is definitely a risk of adjacent segment degeneration when you are going to fuse the cervical spine if you are coming from anterior. And to overcome this, that came the principle of cervical arthroplasty or the artificial disc uh, replacement. But do studies support that there is less disc disease in the adjacent segment? The answer is really not very robust. But then there are some studies which are many company driven. And so we have to take these studies with a pinch of salt. So one cannot just argue that cervical, artificial cervical disc or disc cervical disc replacement is going to replace anterior cervical discectomy and is going to reduce the adjacent segment degeneration. And you have the cost involved here, the heterotopic ossifications, and we still do not have long-term results. The other approach, it can be done also without disturbing the normal disc is the anterior foraminotomy. It's also a versatile approach which can be done so that you don't disturb the normal disc. You can directly go to the foramen and you can avoid fusion. But there are specific indications for this. It is to be done for a unilateral disease. It has a direct approach. It can avoid fusion. The major problem is that once those who have done it will recognize that the problem of bleeding, significant bleeding from the perivertebral venous plexus when you do anteriorly. And uh, there are also problem of Horner syndrome because you are going to work on the longus coli and you have to retract it. So there's a high risk of Horner syndrome. Also, you have a little bit more retraction of the esophagus. And so you can have a problem of esophageal injury in these type of patients. So coming to the main topic of today, posterior foraminotomy. So which patients you select this and what are the advantages we are going to see in the next few slides. So one third of patients with cervical radiculopathy you can go for a posterior foraminotomy. It's very appropriate for unilateral radiculopathy caused by lateral or foraminal stenosis, as I told you earlier. It allows decompression of the nerve root. You're going to see the best approach to see a nerve root and the decompresses posterior foraminotomy. You can see the roots in the anterior disc, uh, disc but you see much more better when you approach it from behind, as I so told you. So it, there are no retraction, there is no structures to be protected when you come from posterior compared to oh, coming from anterior where you have so many neurovascular bundles, whereas nothing is there in the posterior and it, most of the neurosurgeons are familiar with the posterior approach than exposing for a cervical spine. The majority of the advantage is that you need not fuse in posterior foraminotomy because you're not going to disturb the normal disc. You're going to avoid the adjacent segment degeneration. So that is a, one of the main proponents where you can go for posterior foraminotomy. Of course, when you are avoiding a fusion, there is no graft related complications. So this is the structure, a picture, schematic picture which shows the anterior cervical approach and the posterior cervical. You can see that the anterior cervical, the amount of structures to be retracted, you go through, whereas in posterior, it's almost none. So this is the structure you can see that. So you are going to expose or drill part of the lamina foramen to reach the disc. So this is the exam. This is the amount of lamina you are going to expose as the lamina foraminotomy. And you can see that on one side you are going to unilaterally exposure of the facet. 
rephrase it and you see here the amount of uh, drilling which requires to reach the laminar foraminotomy is this picture i'm going to show you some videos of this case and you see that the our uh, disc the root is being exposed when you make a small keyhole approach when you're doing a posterior laminar foraminotomy so this is the patient i'm showing to show you the video as you see as disc prolapse the c67 level as you see this is the posterior uh, posterolateral disc prolapse and this is the minimally invasive approach as you see here the retractor self retaining retractor of metronic and uh, this is the view what you get and i'm going to show this video as you see here so this is the superior facet this is the inferior facet this is on the and uh, this is the medial and that is lateral so i'm going to show you this video so this is the tubular retractor in place and you see that the amount of exposure which is required so you start drilling the superior facet here and once you start drilling then you can reach the inferior facet and uh, you can expose enlarge this foramen to get to the thickal sac so that is the dural margin what you see here and once you retract that and you see just you can probe it and you can find that already you have started seeing this disc and you are going to remove this disc in mass so you can see that that is the protruded fragment postulate and they are going to remove that and that is going to give you a complete relief now that is the post op you can see that you are not disturbing the normal disc the patient has come with radiculopathy and that is the extruded fragment and we have removed that and this patient is healed you come back to this patient you see that so that is the amount of bone which is removed you see that the facets are not much disturbed and you can see that the post operative mri as you see here that the disc is normal this mild disc prolapse but then what is more important is that you can see that there's a good csf space and you can see a good fat pad around the root the root is completely decompressed so that is the principle of posterior laminar foraminotomy and you see that there is complete preservation of the motion segment complete preservation of the normal disc and you are not disturbing that is the coronal mri or you see here and there is the sagittal mri you see that there is no uh, evidence of any discectomy being done and this is going to preserve so that is the advantage of a posterior approach and you are going to preserve the motion segment as you see here very clear very small incision and you can see that there is not much of disturbance in any of these ligaments or bones surprises of course as you see here this patient who came with a disc prolapse a laminar foraminotomy you can see that the huge disc here and i'll show you what is the surprise we encountered in this patient and uh, as you see that's the same amount of that is a superior facet that is inferior facet and i'm going to start uh, removing the uh, laminar foraminotomy the keyhole approach so one can use rare ronger one can use a drill it's all up to their convenience you see here what is happening here that is a thickal sac that is the root i was probing for the disc prolapse the surprise is that there are two roots that is one root and there are other roots so this is a case of a conjoint that you see here that is one root and that is another root so this is not a disc prolapse it was a conjoint root so this is was absolute surprise for us and you see that the disc was normal in this patient so normally we encounter these type of conjoint roots in posterior lumbar approach whereas in cervical usually the incidents we do not know but there are two only two reports of these conjoint roots in cervical spine as you see here is it really that uncommon is not really because most of the time we approach these patients from anterior approach and um, unless we do these cases posteriorly we can totally miss this identity so this type of is an absolute indication for posterior foraminotomy you need not even disturb the disc the treatment for a conjoint root is just to do laminar foraminotomy give space for the root the patient gets relieved by uh, for the radicopathy so these are some of the surprises what you encounter when you do this type of uh, approaches and uh, going ahead you can extrapolate this approach for a disc a small tumors a no sheet tumors which can arise in this location as you see here this is quite a big this big schwannoma which is causing so but one can do with a minimally invasive approach using a laminar so as you see here this is the patient position prone position you mark with the uh, probe see under fluoroscopic guidance you put the retractor here and i'm going to show you the video of uh, how to remove that you can see that the small hole here as minimally invasive foraminotomy so that is a retractor system it's slightly different from what is doing for the disc this is slightly bigger aperture but that, that is a lower holding rod which goes to the table and uh, which connects to the table as you see here 
So now let us go for the video. Uh, same amount of bone is removed, and you drill the bone over there. Already the jamina is very thinned out, uh, so the bone work becomes easier. And uh, once you remove the bone, you start already start seeing the uh, tumor there. I'm sorry for this uh, figure. And you see the that is a tumor there, and you can see that gentle rocking movements, the whole tumor that is the arachna which is pulsating, bulging. So the whole tumor gets removed, and the pulsating arachna, and then you put some surgical cell, and then glue, and then this uh, you will repair the defect. So this is very small incision here, and um, you can see almost 2.5 centimeters incision, and you can do wonderfully this type of approaches. You can see that you are not disturbed much of the normal sagittal balance, and there's a entire tumor of 2.5 centimeters is removed with this minimally invasive technique. So these are some of the uh, extrapolations of this uh, technique. Now coming to the disadvantages, you cannot do this type of approach for all the disc prolapse. So the indication is very, very limited. And you can see that the corridor is also very limited. The major disadvantage what I have encountered in practice is that these patients continue to have some amount of neck pain, probably because you do some periosteal detachment of muscles from the body structures. But then it's self-limiting and usually it all resolves by four to six weeks. And if you remove more than 50% of facet or Bilaterally, if you want to do that, then it can result potentially in some instability. And uh, sometimes, pay patients may develop a kyphosis. C45 disc prolapse is a very narrow space and uh, it's quite challenging for a C45, but I have done many cases for C45 also. Once you start doing that, you will not face this problem. And if you have careless CSF leak, you will have hematoma. So these are the remote complications, but one has to be listed. In this technique, your alternative approaches are these techniques called inclinatory foraminotomy, where only do foraminotomy, do not disturb the disc. And uh, this has been widely now accepted, and uh, uh, many papers are now supporting this. The other is the laser assisted posterior surgical foraminotomy with the less bleeding risk and less neural. Coming to the adjacent segment degeneration, if you see laminar foraminotomy, the risk is very, very less, as you see here, compared to what you do see in anterior cervical foraminotomy and uh, same segment disease. In the, risk, the same segment disease, the risk rate is less in these two patients. And uh, so these are very good robust evidence which is available in the literature. And the reoperation rate is less than 3% when you do posterior cervical foraminotomy. So what you are interested in is whether these patients how many percentage of patients who subsequently underwent anterior cervical discectomy in the same level after the posterior cervical foraminotomy? So there is no significant difference at two-year reoperation rate. That means that the patients need not go a separate second procedure and posterior cervical laminar foraminotomy is self-sufficient in relieving the symptoms in these patients. So to conclude, posterior cervical laminar foraminotomy is a very good technique in appropriately selected patients and they have better long-term outcome. And it is truly minimally invasive. It is cost-effective because there is no graft and there is no um, uh, implant required. And it can be prevented to other major procedures like what I showed, uh, schwannoma and other big tumors can also be removed if you start keeping doing it. And of course, you see some surprises like conjoint root if you continue to do these procedures. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Rupeshar. So it was a very nice talk and very explanatory about uh, anterior and posterior minimally invasive surgeries. So yeah, means again, uh, short of uh, time, we are very short of time. So I, I hand over to Dr. Anila to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Anila. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And we will be introducing our last speaker, Dr. Roger Hartel from Vail Cornell Medical College and US Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Uh, Dr. Roger Hartel is a professor of neurosurgery and director of spinal surgery and neurotrauma. Uh, he is a leading name in the world in the minimally invasive neurosurgery and spine surgery and requires no introduction. We are absolutely honored, Roger, that you can join us uh, for our panel. Um, you can go ahead and do the slide share now. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, that's great. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I've been listening to some of the speakers, and uh, 
I really want to congratulate uh, Anila and the organizers for putting together a great, great online symposium. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of this. And uh, I was asked to uh, talk to you about MIS TLIF. And uh, I'll be happy to do that, of course. Um, I'm, at, uh, I'm a neurosurgeon. I do mainly spine surgery. At, uh, I'm located at Wild Cornell, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital in, in New York City. And um, a fair amount of my practice is minimum invasive spinal surgery. And um, I want to talk to you about MIS TLIF, which really has become uh, one of the main uh, MIS procedures that surgeons do. And there's fairly good data that it uh, is a uh, very helpful, very successful operation for especially for degenerative uh, uh, issues, of course. First introduced probably in the early 2000s by Kevin Foley, who really pioneered this operation and, uh, and, and then really developed further by many, many surgeons. And now I think it's a, it's a total standard operation that we do uh, uh, several times a week uh, in appropriate patients. Now, where's the benefit of MIS? I just want to show you this uh, because uh, it really illustrates the importance of MIS TLIF and some of the principles that are behind this operation. If you, look at, um, if you look at open traditional surgery and you, and you plot the complexity versus invasiveness, you can see that um, it, it goes up pretty steep and uh, procedures, as the complexity increases, the uh, procedures become pretty invasive uh, at an early stage. Now with minimal invasive surgery, you essentially you flatten that curve. And that's the benefit. So the difference between those two curves, that's really the benefit zone between, between, uh, for, for MIS surgery. And MIS TLIF is right in the center. So I think it really has become a workhorse procedure for those of us who do MIS surgery, together with uh, the translumbar or OLIF types of procedures, and obviously the uh, MIS decompression through tubular or endoscopic retractors. So, so, so just to show you that it is such an important part of what we do as MIS uh, surgeons. Now, um, I also want to talk, uh, as, I, as I walk you through my workflow for MIS T-lift surgery, you, real, real, you will realize that I use a lot of navigation. And I know that navigation is not available to some of the participants probably of the course at this point. Maybe some of you have it already. Uh, however, I know that the technology is evolving. More and more surgeons are going to have it available. And that's why I want to give you a little bit of an uh, idea as to how to integrate navigation into your uh, MIS T-lift surgery and really into most of uh, the fusion procedures that we do and even some of the decompression procedures. Now, we, uh, we, I've been using navigation for you know, 15 plus years, first in brain surgery, and then uh, when I started doing uh, uh, spine surgery, we really translated that. And we, we use it now for about 75% of our cases. So there's hardly any uh, uh, fluoroscopy being used. Nobody wears lead. And we use navigation really from start to finish. We use it to plan uh, the skin incision uh, when we do our cases to insert the screws, to place the tubular retractor to do the decompression and so forth. And um, it's like everything with technology, you kind of become used to this and, and you extend the applications. We published this, we published our experience with um, navigation uh, for MIS T-lift surgery a few years ago. And uh, as I mentioned, so I'm gonna walk you through it. Now we use this type of navigation, which is an integrated system that combines navigation uh, with an, a true intraoperative CT scanner, but you can do the same thing with fluoro CT type uh, uh, setups. Now, the workflow for MIS TLIF that I use currently is depicted on the slide. I insert the reference array for the navigation into the iliac crest. We get a spin, and then we navigate the screws. Uh, we insert the screws through two skin incisions. Um, it's very uh, since we don't use fluoroscopy, obviously, you have to make 100% sure that you trust the accuracy of your navigation and there are certain tricks to do that. Um, and then uh, once we have inserted the screws, uh, we'll put in the uh, tubular retractors. We use navigation for that. We do the discectomy. We do the cage. And then at the end, before we put the rods, we get a final spin to make sure that everything is accurate. Uh, that's the uh, setup in the operating room uh, when the patient is being prepped. So that's the intraoperative CT scanner, anesthesia, 
uh, the scrub nurse, we have the navigation unit here. I use a microscope. As you can see, there's no fluoroscopy needed because, uh, again, we uh, rely on, on navigation. And you have to become comfortable. There's not something you can just start doing. You really have to um, uh, go through uh, some efforts to make sure that your navigation is 150% accurate. Uh, when we get the scan, everybody leaves, so there's no, so there's no, um, uh, there's no um, uh, radiation to the surgeon or the staff. Uh, this is the uh, patient being uh, taped to the operating room table for navigation. Again, we rely on navigation, so I tape the patient down. All the soft tissue is under tension, uh, and that increases the accuracy of the navigation. Uh, obviously, we, that's, I mark the iliac crest here, uh, and, uh, and then we get the spin and start uh, navigating. Uh, the iliac crest, the, the reference array is attached to the iliac, iliac crest here via two pins. I mark the midline here. The iliac crest is marked just for reference when you put in the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, when you put in the, the pins. That's uh, when we get the CAT scan, so we uh, uh, tape, uh, we, we cover the patient and then we start the operation. And as you can see here, from the very beginning, even the skin incision is being planned with navigation. And you plan the skin incision in a perfect trajectory for the pedicle screws. So an elongation of the pedicle trajectory to the skin. You make the skin incision here. You make the fascial incision here. And then you have a perfect trajectory into the pedicle. We call that don't fight uh, the fascia. If you make the skin incision here and the fascial incision over there, You'll, you'll introduce potential inaccuracy when you put in your screw because you have to push against the fascia and that may change the anatomy. I'm just giving you some, some of the little tricks and tips that we kind of learned over the years to really maximize accuracy. Now, uh, we, uh, several companies now have these types of pedicle screws available. These are single pass pedicle screws. As you can see here, they incorporate a K wire into the tip. They have a very aggressive screw tip. We navigate this pedicle screw and that allows us to really cut down on the number of instruments that we have to navigate. Uh, so there's no gym sheety needle, there's no awl, there's no tap. Everything is incorporated into this uh, pedicle screw. Makes it very easy and makes, makes it very cost effective and time effective to insert this pedicle screw under navigation. So, um, um, so that's the pedicle screw. Uh, it's navigated, as you can see here. That's the tip of the pedicle screw. And we... Um, uh, we register it uh, for the navigation system. We have a small skin incision here. Uh, we tap so the KY that, that's sticking out uh, attaches to the, uh, the, the bone. And then we insert the pedicle screw under direct uh, navigation. Um, you can see here that uh, uh, you, know, you really have to uh, obviously make sure that you penetrate the bone. So we we've used this pedicle screw now maybe for a year and a half or two years. And we've been very happy with this. Every pedicle screw takes about two and a half minutes uh, and, uh, and is very accurate overall. Now, um, uh, once we have the pedicle screw inserted, uh, we'll, we'll harvest uh, a bone from the iliac crest. And again, we use navigation for that. Uh, you, can, uh, you can navigate your little harvesting device uh, through the same incision. You've got some nice bone graft for your interbody fusion later on. Uh, and then you place your tubular retractor uh, so again, for, for that, we use navigation, as you can see here. Uh, you uh, make a second fascial incision that's more medial uh, from the incision that you made for the pedicle screws, and then you place your tubular retractor. And now this, these are some drawings from, from AO Spine. We worked with AO Spine on, a, uh, on teaching material for MIST lift surgery. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so this uh, shows you the MIST lift on the right side at L4, L5. Uh, so you place your tubular retractor, and then you see the facet joint here under the uh, under the microscope. I use this. I do this with a microscope, but you can do it with loops as well. And then you start uh, orienting yourself. And again, you can use navigation for this. Uh, it sounds a little bit uh, uh, maybe uh, initially if you're not uh, if you haven't done that, it sounds uh, maybe uh, as overkill. However, once you start using navigation, it becomes it comes in very handy. For example, here you can. You know you're going to drill and you want to get into the parse to, to uh, disengage the intra-articulating process. So you can uh, look at the uh, navigation. It shows you the parse uh, so you know exactly where you have to drill to. 
from the inferior edge of the L4 lamina, for example. So you do that, you drill from the inferior edge of the L4 lamina towards the pars here. Uh, you remove the piece of bone and then you use that for your fusion later on. And this, by the way, is, is exactly the same that you would do with open T-lift surgery as well. Um, uh, so you try to remove the facet joint to get access to the disc space and then do a decompression. The next step then is um, we, you can do with a, with a ball tip or with navigation, you can find the uh, L5 pedicle here and you drill or you can use an osteotome. And again, you disconnect the superarticulating process here to harvest that bone for your fusion. Um, in this case, we use navigation to find the pedicle. Then, uh, then you see the space, uh, you see the uh, traversing nerve root here, the exiting nerve root there. And then you start uh, working on your discectomy. And here also navigation can become handy, especially in patients who have a very collapsed display, disc space or where it is hard to really get into the disc space. You can use navigation to find a step off in patients where um, there is significant uh, spondylolisthesis. And then you can confirm that you actually got into the disc space and uh, are in the, in the right position. Uh, at that point then, once we've done the discectomy, uh, we use the bone that we harvested, we grind it up and we put it into the disc space and into the uh, cage. And that's planning of the cage here. Uh, again, you, use sim you can simulate the cage, the positioning of the cage exactly in the middle. Uh, and that's where navigation also uh, comes in very handy. Uh, and uh, that's placement of the uh, titanium cage through the tubular retractor. This is the bone graft that has been placed into the, into the disc space. Now we put the cage in here and um, Again, we use navigation to make sure that we have nice uh, placement. Now, a lot of patients will require a decompression. Some patients may have severe lumbar spinal stenosis. So in those patients, now, uh, you want to do a, a decompression of the, the, the spinal uh, canal, the fecal sac. And that's when the over-the-top decompression comes in. So now we're, we're uh, rotating the table away uh, and we're angling the tubular retractor to get access to the inferior uh, portion of the spinous process, and then eventually to the contralateral lamina. We, pr we leave the, uh, dura, the uh, uh, ligamentum flavum sometimes intact, or we protect the dura with suction tip, and then we drill and uh, decompress the spinal canal. So that's essentially uh, what we do here. We get a bilateral decompression from a unilateral approach, and we call that over-the-top decompression. Navigation can be helpful here to confirm that you made it all the way to the other lateral recess and you can actually do a contralateral foraminotomy there. And again, navigation can help you to confirm that. There's even a movie that was made about this, Over the Top, my joke for the day. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then finally, uh, then we get a scan. Once everything has been, um, uh, once everything has been inserted, we get a sca scan to make sure that the screws are fine and then the rods are being placed. You can also get a reduction of the spondylolisthesis if you want. In this case, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do that. Uh, but uh, there are other things you can do now. You can, uh, you can uh, you, there are some pedicle screw systems available. In the US, there was a big deal to get the pedicle screws that are actually suitable and FDA approved for cement injection. Now they're available. I know in, in, in Europe and Asia, uh, you fed those for a long time. Or sometimes uh, we have patients who have two-level lumbar stenosis. And in those patients, we will do, for example, if they have instability at one level, but no, instabil no instability at the other level, we will do an MIS T level at L4-5 and just a tubular decompression at the level um, above. And we call that one and a half T lift. We just published that. And that works very nicely. It really avoids a two-level fusion in those patients where it's not, uh, where it's not needed. Uh, sometimes, <clears throat> however, you have to do a two-level T-lift, and that's the case here where we did a, uh, uh, a tandem slalom MIS uh, T-lift. Uh, we had two microscopes available, so the assistant or the fellow worked on the other side, so did one, one side of the T-lift. I did the other one. We put the cages in from opposite sides, as you can see here. So that's where MIS becomes really interesting. Once you can really match, mix and match and use different uh, types of technology and uh, hopefully cut down on some of the time uh, and make this whole um, MIS surgery more time uh, efficient. Because as you know, if you have to do everything yourself, it takes quite some time, even, even if you have experience and if you're good. 
So um, we wrote up our experience with navigation and spine surgery and um, it was published in World Neurosurgery a few years ago. And we found that uh, overall in our spinal practice, and I'm talking about not only my practice, but also my colleagues here at, uh, at, uh, at Wild Cornell, we eliminated fluoroscopy really in about 75% of our cases. And we think that navigation makes uh, surgery safer. Uh, there's really no malplacement anymore. Or if, if there is malplacement, you can uh, pick it up while the patient is still in the operating room and therefore fix it. It's very time efficient once you get used to it, once you have your team on board. And it is cost effective because it prevents uh, revision or it avoids uh, revision surgeries, which are very expensive. Uh, facilitate some of the more complex procedures and uh, especially MIS. So I also, at the end of my talk, I want to make you aware of an effort that is ongoing right now through AO Spine. And um, uh, so we're, we're putting together a, an MIS uh, curriculum uh, that will be taught at all the MIS uh, spine courses uh, worldwide uh, through the AO. And uh, we, uh, we talk about MIS t lift procedures. We talk about uh, uh, basic skills such as using the microscope, uh, navigation, how to fix a CSF uh, leak through a tubular retractor. We talk about endoscopic procedures. So if you have an interest in, in getting involved or if you have, uh, the, we're still at a relatively early stage, uh, let me know and I'm happy to share some more information with you or uh, look out for this at some of the upcoming AO Spine courses uh, uh, maybe next year where this uh, will hopefully be put into practice. So, uh, and for those of you who want to come to New York, we have our 13th MIS Navigation Augmented Reality Endoscopy course in December at Wild Cornell. Let me know. I'm happy to uh, uh, get you involved and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you so, so much, Dr. Roger Hartel, for a wonderful talk and uh, also for letting us, all the participants, know that if they are interested in pursuing a, a workshop in MIS, they can either go to your institute or can uh, register through one of the AO spine in the nearby regional areas. Um, this uh, ends our symposium uh, on minimally invasive spine surgery. I am uh, thankful to all the organizers, Divya, Hera, Sharon, Dr. Rupesh, and uh, Abhi, and uh, every one of us who had helped to put this course together. I'm thankful to all the giants in spine surgery who have actually come here uh, to teach this course on a Sunday, which is usually a family day. Uh, and I also want to let the participants know that this whole uh, video is actually available on YouTube. Uh, should you wish to see it again later on in your spare time, or if you want to wish to share it with your other colleagues. Uh, with this, uh, John, I think I'm going to end uh, the symposium right now. If anybody has a burning question, uh, just one or two for one of our participants, please come up right now and uh, uh, tell the question. Yeah. Hello. Dr. Pathiban, yeah. Go ahead. Dr. Roger, it was excellent talk and uh, really enjoyed that uh, the talk on navigation. Uh, definitely navigation has changed the uh, the minimally invasive spinal surgery. Uh, that's what I feel, but the, it's really well, wonderful that uh, you are using uh, double microscopes in two ways so that it cuts short the time and the navigation procedure becomes much easier. It's very wonderful. Yeah, nice. I mean, I would also pass on the means, uh, extend my thanks to all the speakers for ha taking your time on Sunday and all the panelists. Mm -hmm. And please, uh, means if you have any suggestions, suggestions to improve or what you want to uh, like do for the next time or any comments, like you can, uh, you feel free to pass on the uh, information to us and comments to us so that uh, we can do better. In the next online symposiums. So thank you. Thank you all.